Good evening, all. Uh, we have come to the second program of the three series where we are discussing about evidence, experience, and expertise in arthroscopy. And for this week, uh, uh, in our program, the theme is going to be on preserving the meniscus. So the theme is the meniscus preservation. And I'm glad to say that we have uh, five speakers in that. And the three speakers are going to tell about uh, evidence on various aspects of meniscus. And the two speakers are senior people and who are going to share about their real experience about uh, meniscus repair and their outcomes. So we have divided the evidence split into, first is about, uh, we have gone from uh, meniscectomy to meniscus repair era now. And uh, uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar is uh, associate post, assistant post in orthopedics in uh, Velamar Medical College. He's one of the arthroscopic surgeons there. He's going to tell us about indications of meniscus repair past and present as per the literature. And then next, uh, repairing meniscus has been started long while well now and has to really reach the reality by preventing degeneration. And what the evidence is saying about is going to be told about uh, Dr. Girish Kumar, who is a consultant orthopedic and arthroscopic surgeon at uh, Aradhana Orthopedic Center in Shivamoga in Karnataka. And then uh, next speech is going to be given by uh, uh, Dr. Chaitanya from uh, Buntu. He is a consultant, arthroscopic and scientific medicine surgeon at the Sri Pratima Super Specialty Hospital. And he is going to tell about uh, root tear management, what the clinical evidence says. And then the experience part is going to be told about two senior surgeons. One is uh, Dr. Nilesh Thomas, who is from uh, Pune. He is a consultant, arthroscopic surgeon over there, who has been practicing for many years. He has done uh, expert in uh, doing meniscus repairs. And he is going to tell about how he does uh, meniscus repair, They're explaining about the technique. And the last is going to be about Professor Reni Veda, who is a well-known name in meniscus uh, preservation surgery. And he has written a book about meniscus repair and all. And uh, he is going to tell about his experience of meniscus repair. Uh, last minute, he could not join us, so he has sent his uh, video recorded presentation, which I will put it at the end. And he might come in at the end for discussion. Bit. So that's what going to be the today's uh, event. Uh, I would like to thank all the uh, faculty and also all the participants and also who are watching the YouTube and also Arthur TV for participating in this event. And uh, special thanks to Sun Pharma Group for organizing this event and also thanks to Arthur TV team for telecasting this. Thank you very much. Let's go to the scientific program now. Uh, if there are questions during the scientific program, they can put in the chat box, which can be discussed at the end or in between the talks also. So uh, let's go to the scientific session now and uh, may I invite uh, Dr. Krishna Kumar for giving his uh, talk on indications of meniscus repair, past and present as per the literature. Dr. Krishna Kumar, are you ready to share your screen? Switch off your mute. Your mute is on. Dr. Krishna Kumar, uh, are you not able to hear you? Sir, Please, can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead. Yeah, okay. I like, I like to thank Dr. Kainas Subramanian, sir, for giving me the opportunity to talk on the presentation of uh, meniscus repair, past and present, as per the literature. Before going to the indication, I like to introduce, uh, give some introduction about the meniscus. So, the meniscus is essential for um, normal function for the knee joint. And it prevents the capsular and synovial impingement during flexion and extension movements. And it also, it also has a joint replication function, helping to distribute synovial fluid throughout the joint and aiding the nutrition of the articular cartilage. And it also contributes to the stability in all planes, but especially or more rotatory stabilizers, stabilizers. And it is also a shock absorbing function. I'm not going to explain on the brief of anatomy before I'd like to explain some uh, vascular anatomy uh, of the meniscus. That the mass vascular supply for both medial and uh, lateral meniscus uh, originate predominantly from the medial and lateral geniculate arteries, both from the inferior and the superior uh, uh, geniculate arteries. From there, it, creates, it gives rise to the branches to the peripheral perimeniscal capillary plexus. Capillary plexus. And which supplies the uh, 
peripheral border of the meniscus these vessels are oriented in predominantly predominantly circumferential pattern with radial branches directed towards the center of the joints so the meniscus are divided into three zones based on their vascularity the red red white zone and blue white zone so here some uh, evidence showing that in the cadaver uh, aronsky uh, et al shows in cadaveric study found that the radial branches penetrate the meniscus to the depth of 2 to 3 cm 2 to 3 mm with the most consistent blood supply occurring at the anterior and posterior horn and uh, peterson et al uh, reviewed cadaveric specimen of human meniscus ranging in age from birth to 80 years old and found that at birth the whole meniscus was vascularized and by the second year they had a wave vascular area on the inner circumference by the age of 20 the blood vessels were only present in the peripheral third which further regressed to a quarter at the age of 50 so this article rubman rubman et al published a series of 198 repairs that extended into a wave vascular zone and 80 were clinically successful with 20% requiring reoperation at uh, at the uh, at the period of 42 months in uh, this article uh, galacher et al performed all inside meniscus repair in white and uh, white on white zone and had a 68% success rate with significant gains in lesion score however the follow up was limited at 12 months and success was determined on the reoperation rate only so 28 patient patients required further surgeries of them eight required re, re repair and 20 required meniscectomy in this uh, in this article noise et al a series with the longest follow up of, of, of about um, 16.8 uh, years he also had a successful outcome in this series of uh, 29 meniscal repair in patients with meniscal tear extending into the central avascular region they had 38% failure with six patients requiring meniscectomies and two developing early onset arthritis and three patients although asymptomatic had failed repairs on uh, MRI evaluation so some author feel that unhealed menisci which remained reduced with adequate fixation contribute to load transmission and therefore protect articular cartilage so here here are the some repair zone in the avascular uh, avascular uh, region so rubam et al uh, conducted a series of 177 patients uh, at the mean follow up of about uh, 42 months and all the patients were uh, performed by inside out inside out technique and the outcomes of uh, of uh, 177 patients 20% required repeated arthroscopy of 91 arthroscopy 50 58% further go for meniscal surgery in noise et al the uh, number of patients was 29 the mean age uh, mean uh, age was uh, 16 years and follow up of about 16 years all patients under, underwent inside out technique and uh, the outcome was six meniscectomies and two early onset oe and three failed mri and in galacher 87 patients of uh, in, uh, 87 patients in this study and the mean follow up of about uh, 12 months Uh, in white zone and uh, all were all underwent all inside technique and lesion scores of about 67 to 61 to 75 and 8 went re repair and 20 went meniscectomy following uh, primary repair and noise et al uh, of 29 patients at 33 months uh, follow uh, in red white zone and all went uh, underwent inside out technique and uh, outcome the only three patients has a partial meniscectomy here are some uh, uh, here are the classifications of uh, meniscal tear uh, which the first one is a longitudinal tear radial and oblique tear horizontal tear complex tear and tear associated cyst and uh, discoid menisci so the indications for repair are on the patient factors on the tear factors so on the patient factors the patient is a young age less than 40 years and in active patients and the patients are, uh, with no significant comorbidities and the uh, bmi should be less than 30 years 
and willingness to complete with post operative rehabilitation regimen and the based on uh, indication for tier factor 6 uh, uh, red red and red white zone are ideal but not mandatory and simple tear pattern and the time period is less than 3 months old injury and uh, associated with acl reconstructions and the meniscus is reducible without excess tension and lower tr- uh, threshold for complete radial tears the contraindications for the uh, meniscal repair are the grade 3 and 4 osteoarthritis irreducibility of tears as the meniscus would be under too high tension and central radiator less than 25% so based on the patient age here are here the articles noise at all evaluate the repair outcomes in patient with mean age 45 who undergone meniscal repair with or without acl reconstructions and uh, the patient had a, uh, the outcome had a uh, very good in uh, 88% and three requiring meniscectomy at age at the um, 33 month follow up and suggest meniscal repair should be considered in active patients regardless of the age and another article shows that uh, joel et al found a strong relationship between the time from injury and the extent of tear and subsequent meniscectomy volume and suggest me- symptomatic meniscal meniscal tear should be operated on a- as early as possible it has been well established that there is a significantly lower chance of meniscal repair as a time from the injury progress and uh, hmer et al uh, ca- uh, conducted a series of 39 isolated meniscal repair at a mean follow up of 17 years at early follow up the overall failure rate was 42% of this 42% 80 uh, 80% of complex tears and 47% of bucket handle tears had higher overall rate failures than the simple tears. So no further failure occurred after with them follow up with any tear type. So in uh, meniscal tear associated with the anterior cruciate ligament injury in an uh, ACL deficient knee medial meniscectomy had shown to be increased tibial translation by 58% at 90 at 90 degree. so where is the primary and posterior translation were not affected by lateral meniscectomy healing rate of 90% have been reported in conjugation with acl reconstruction preserving the meniscus especially median meniscus has shown to improve knee stability when associated with acl reconstructions so in this article uh, the wasserstein team at all compared 1332 patients who underwent meniscal repair with or without uh, acl reconstruction at the mean age of 25 years using a variety of repairing techniques they found meniscal repair performed with uh, in conjunction with uh, acl reconstruction had 7% absolute and 42% relative risk reduction of re-op- reoperation at 2 uh, years follow up so there are some techniques in the meniscal repairs uh, the open technique and the which is the uh, and the inside out technique outside in technique and all inside technique so in inside out technique uh, the mini- uh, the repair suitable for uh, this technique for posterior and medial third of the meniscus and in outside in technique the repair of anterior and middle third of the meniscus uh, is suitable so in this article uh, libel et al found that the inside out meniscal repair technique has shown improved subjective and objective patients outcome and remain the standard of the care of for meniscal repair this technique is best used for posterior con middle third peripheral capsule and bucket handle tears so the in goodwill the this article shows that the advantages of uh, inside out technique include the versatility of the placing uh, uh, sutures lower implant cost and use of low profile needles that allow for multiple sutures without compromising the compromising the structural integrity of the meniscus so drawback of these techniques include additional incision risk of neurovascular injury and uh, need for assistant and theoretically an increased procedure time so the uh, here are the summary, uh, summary of the open meniscal repair with long term follow up uh in demand at all the number of patients is 30 and mean follow up of about uh, 11 years uh in red red zone the outcome of this uh, following open meniscal repair is uh, 28% has a rate and in uh, mulner uh, at all 
on our total number of patients is 22 of uh, 13 years follow up of of 22% 9% has a recur and 27% has a degenerative changes and rockbone et al found that uh, in 20, 31 patients of mean follow up of 13 years and the patients had a 29% as a uh, patients of a uh, uh, the study have, has gone for a return. And this is for all insight meniscal repair the outcomes. Here, the Jones conducted of about 38 per, uh, patients at mean of 20 30 months follow. -up. Here, in this uh, study, the outcomes of uh, 38 person patients, two patients went for partial meniscectomy and 31.6 persons local irritative symptoms and two removal of fragments. In Gill et al, the uh, 32 patients, the, uh, of 32 patients, 9.4% uh, failure rate and three patients went for partial meniscectomy. So in Lee, they were conducted of about 32 patients and the mean follow-up of about 6.6 .6 years and 28% of uh, uh, failure rate. So the longest follow-up of about 30 to 54 months, Cruzwell et al. Uh, conducted in 57 patients of this, 28% that's a failure rate following the primary repair. And the barber at all conducting uh, uh, 41 patients of 30 point, 31 months uh, follow up, and the lism score has been improved. And 70 patients, 17 uh, percent has gone for meniscectomy following the primary repair. And the last one is uh, Conan at all uh, of 18 months follow up of 18 months follow up. And, uh, the outcome measure shows the 22 percent failure rate of uh, uh, meniscus and 10. 10.3 failure rate uh, at the fast fix and three painful capsules which are requiring resurgery removal. So systematic review of 19 patients, 19 studies to compare the outcome of the all inside and uh, inside out technique and isolated meniscal tear in presence of an intact ACL at the mean uh, follow up of about 38 months. They found no significant difference in the clinical failure rate of 17% for inside out repair compared with 19% uh, for uh, all inside technique. So although there were similar functional scores, there were significantly higher rate of neurological injury, injury in the inside out repair. So it should noted that there were higher complication rate in older generation of all, all inside repairs with utilize rigid device compared with the newer suture based techniques. So here the studies for Paxton et al. Uh, uh, systematic review of reoperation rate that the patient undergoes meniscal repair are much more likely to have further procedure compared, compared with the patients undergoing meniscectomy at yearly and long-term follow-up. And this study strain at all shows that long-term uh, functional outcome in athlete, athletics and uh, found that although there were no difference at mid-term follow-up, uh, with regard to return to sports, patients undergoing partial meniscectomy had significant worse outcome at long-term follow -up. So they found that only 50% in partial meniscectomy group were able to return to sports compared with 96% in a repair group at, eight, uh, at mean of 8.8 year follow-up. So extensive research currently is under studying methods to improve the healing rate of meniscus using the meniscus, uh, using meniscal stimulation uh, marrow venting procedures and the use of fibrin clots, PRP injections, stem cell uh, based therapies. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna, Dr. Krishna Kumar. I think you covered it extensively. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, there are no questions in the chat box. Excellent. You you definitely favor uh, meniscus repair, but the uh, overall outcome seems to be around uh, seventy to ninety percent. Is that what you see? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, definitely not like forty fifty percent. Seventy percent is a good outcome. I think uh, let's huh? go on to the next talk. And next is going to be Dr. Grishma.
and who is going to tell about uh, repairing meniscus prevents degeneration how much are we reaching reality dr girish are you ready to share screen yes sir is it visible sir yeah yeah it's visible please go ahead okay uh, good evening all uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, dr k n subramanian sir for giving me this opportunity to present on repairing meniscus uh the prevents degeneration uh, are we reaching reality originally described by uh, bland sutton in 1897 as functionless remnants of intraarticular leg muscles but with all the knowledge gained over the years menisci are currently uh, recognized one of the most important structures determining the future of the knee joint therefore awareness of meniscal anatomy and the attempts to save the menisci is a key in preventing Uh, early knee osteoarthritis menisci are predominantly uh, composed uh, of about uh, uh, of water uh, about 65 to 75% and collagen of 20 to 25% with other 5% made up of non collagenous uh, substances including proteoglycans matrix glycoproteins and elastin the collagenous network has a complex orientation which greatly influences function the function of menisci is largely attributed to their biomechanical properties one of the important you know, being viscoelasticity meaning that throughout an applied force uh, they exhibit both viscous and elastic properties these viscoelasticity pro- property plays a large role in uh, resisting compression force uh, on cartilage when a compressive force uh, load is applied to the menisci an axial load causes an axial load causes uh, uh, hoop stresses to the circumferential fibers of the menisci these hoop stresses allow distribution of stresses over large area of cartilage size shape of menisci play a large role in their function medial meniscus covers uh, anywhere from 50 to uh, 54% of tibial articular articulation cartilage and lateral meniscus uh, from anywhere uh, 59 to 71% by covering a large surface area uh, the menisci function in load transmission and distribution by increasing uh, 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 by uh, increasing the congruency of uh, tibio femoral compartment if menisci are not functioning properly contact areas will decrease and contact stress will increase which can lead to uh, increased stresses on the articular cartilage so even resection of 15 to 35 4% of meniscal tissue increases load on cartilage of up to 350% this is important because a linear relationship exists between the amount of meniscus removed and peak stresses supporting the idea to uh, conserve as much as meniscus as possible uh, and performing a meniscal repair over meniscectomy size and shape of menisci allow for congruency between femur and tibia with the intact menisci limiting excess motion in all uh, directions and helping to stabilize the knee joint joint stabilizing capabilities of the menisci are mostly prominent in acl deficient uh, knees following medial meniscectomy in the acl deficient knee there is a increase in uh, anterior tibial translation and acl failure uh, menisci play a large role in lubrication and following meniscectomy the coefficient of uh, friction increases and the menisci have an important sensory feedback role in uh, uh, knee for many years uh, total meniscectomy was the preferred treatment for symptomatic meniscal tears uh, since uh, tapper and hoover highlighted the high rates of osteoarthritis following meniscectomies partial meniscectomies uh, uh, has been the most common treatment for meniscal tears although uh, uh, partial meniscectomy has a good uh, short term outcomes there are long term negative sequelae to removing meniscal tissues today uh, meniscal suturing uh, can be uh, seen as a gold standard for the regenerative treatment of uh, meniscal tears uh, but the important question that arises is whether uh, the patient will benefit either in a short term or a long term uh, by maintaining a, a meniscal tissue and whether especially in contrast to meniscectomy uh, the meniscal preservation will prevent knee osteoarthritis to see that we will see some studies as discussed by dr krishna kumar uh, the factor there are multiple factors affecting the outcomes of uh, meniscectomy after uh, meniscal repair uh, sorry so this slide i will skip uh, coming to the uh, results uh, the researchers uh, like uh, 
the short term results uh, the researcher conducted literature review of the different elig rates uh, observed by second look arthroscopy arthro mri and uh, uh, a ct scan clinical results of meniscal repairs are good to excellent in more than 80% of cases so uh, coming to the uh, long term results uh, as discussed by krishna kumar noels et al evaluated the meniscal status of 33 patients having meniscal sutures after a mean follow up of uh, 16.8 years there were no degenerative changes in the operated compartment or uh, differences concerning the status of uh, degeneration in the comparison to the healthy uh, johnson et al compared the injured and la- contralateral knee joint of 10 years after uh, meniscal suturing on a radiological basis while 8% of these patients developed osteoarthritis signs on the operated sites there were degenerative changes uh, in the contralateral side also in about 3% the paxton uh about 78% of the patient had no progress of osteoarthritis status according to the x-ray after having reconstruction of the meniscus so overall the current literature uh, shows a significant positive effect of a uh, meniscus tissue preserving therapy on the knee uh, joint function in long term uh, as discussed by uh, krishna kumar rupture of meniscal tissues are frequently associated with concomitant acl ruptures in patients with uh, uh, concomitant acl ruptures however preservation of uh, meniscus may be even more important as uh, additional preservation of meniscus showed increase uh, in knee stability additionally the meniscus may have a positive effect on uh, graft protection as well as uh, uh, total resection of middle meniscus may uh, increase the force on the acl by about 33 to 50% so uh, coming to the overall results there are several studies i have reported the success rate of meniscal repair to be anywhere uh, as uh, subramanian sir told uh, from 70 to 90% the failure is typically defined by continued pain at the tibiofemoral joint likely from an unhealed repair requiring subsequent meniscectomy in a systemic review at a 5 year follow up failures range from 20 to 24% but the important thing is Uh, uh the pujol et al indicated the amount of meniscus needed for resection following repair was either lower uh, or equal to the amount of resection that uh, would have been needed at the time of primary surgery if re- repair was not done so with the development of uh, diagnostic uh, techniques for meniscal injury the volume of arthroscopic procedures to treat uh, injured meniscus dramatically increased in recent years partial meniscectomy has been widely used for patients who underwent a failure of non operative treatment in early years however with deep understanding of the biomechanical function of uh, meniscus surgeon realized that meniscectomy procedure can improve uh, pain and knee function at short term follow up but the loss of meniscal tissue uh, also lead to onset of early arth- arthritis at the long or- long term comparing with meniscectomy meniscal repair can preserve its tissues thus restore its biomechanical function reducing the risk of uh, uh, developing a knee osteoarthritis in the future so in all this uh, the consensus has been reached that meniscal tissue should be preserved as much as uh, possible to prevent future osteoarthritis thank you thank you girish thank you very much sir. thank you sir i think the final verdict is to preserve as much as you can yes sir yes sir but um, uh have you gone to literature as- asking about how much healing occurs when you do meniscus repair uh, it heal- conducted uh, uh, both invasive and non invasive procedures like invasive second look arthroscopy and even ct uh, uh, arthrography or mri arthrography and uh, they have found that uh, more than 70% uh, but at a short term outcome maybe after 6 months there will be a definitely edema and uh, uh, effusion but in a long term they definitely will show a good results in about 70 to 80% yes yes i do agree your view nilesh what do you think so i think i think that was a fantastic talk because uh, it was it was very relevant now what i wanted to point out was that probably in the last 10 years all of us have been doing adequate meniscal repairs and to come to think of it the number of times i have had to go in and 
and deal with an unhealed meniscus or a retear and and that's what I was thinking the numbers are probably less than 5 so so the question of seeing a meniscus being unhealed on radiology and a meniscus being clinically unhealed i think the previous spoke, speaker also spoke about this that meniscal repairs have been shown to hold the tissue even if it is unhealed if the if the number of sutures which pass across the meniscus are good enough they do have some contraprotective action and probably that is the that is one of the rationales of doing a stack repair not just put menisci or not just putting anchors on the superior surface but you would also want to put it inferior so that it sits down and you have a multi axial kind of fixation so it How is many? like um, what i seen is some of them might be having incomplete healing but still can be that's true so it should be acceptable clinically they are okay yeah so, that's true and they, they might be totally okay for years and yes. some therapy effect of the meniscus can be useful also that's what uh, is the message i think how um, many times how many yeah, times have you had to go in and uh, and take out a meniscus after after a repair myself yeah in the last 10 years um probably few cases uh, pay yeah, some so that's what my point with, uh, i can't tell the numbers exactly but uh, single digits like that yeah Yeah, so that's exactly what my point is. That's exactly what my point is. So it's worthwhile doing as much meniscal repairs as possible. Mm-hmm. But uh, one thing is we have to be very clear about indication also. Uh, but the indication yeah, absolutely. is absolutely standard now. But uh, we have to be careful about indication. But uh, there are certain things like bucket handle tear where you are not able to reduce it totally. Chronic ones, you may know that you are going enough. to fail. So don't not to go ahead and repair it. That's kind of yes. Yeah. Agree. Agree. So Sir, how, may, how much? How much time? Uh, yeah, please. Hi, Sir, Doctor Vishwanath here, Sir, from Down. Ah, ah, Doctor. Hi, Doctor. Hi, Doctor Girish. Hello, Sir. Hello, Sir. Uh, sir, actually, we were uh, last week when we were doing one ACL, Sir, there was a bucket handle tear, Sir. Uh, ah. Girish was doing. So he was telling on table like, uh, see, we, we, nowadays uh, we are still uh, doing the meniscus repair up to six months. Is it? Uh, Yes, yeah. As uh, I'm, you know, there is a study from Arthur one about this uh, scoring system. In yes, sir. System, they have mentioned up to one year. Up to okay. one year, you can still uh, think about it's not chronic. Okay. What's but, your experience, sir? But general view is from my own view is uh, I anything more than three months, I think it is a little chronic only because okay. they lose that factors uh, to be there. So if it is age, is an important factor. If somebody is okay. a younger age group, like twenty year yeah. old, then you can still think of repairing. If they are more than one year old also, because the age will okay. help you. Okay, sir. Uh, and the traumatic injury, age, peripheral tear, they are the one you can. Don't worry about the time; you can still repair it. Yes, sir. Yes. You wish what's what's your age? Uh, I think <laughs> you know, I, I, I was there all the time with you, but you are doing so much. <laughs> I need I just uh, share your experience. Okay. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> not, not much experience, as uh, sir, sir told. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as sir told, like uh, any injuries, like uh, if it can be retracted to the uh, uh, torn site, uh, definitely bucket handle tear. Uh, even after six months, I'll try to repair. But if it is uh, there is a too much tension, and uh, if it is too much degenerated, definitely uh, we have to think for other th- treatment. Thank you. Thank you. You are doing Girish. Yeah, I have learned so many things from you only. <laughs> thank you. Sir. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Subramanian, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Girish. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move on to the yes. talk. Yes, sir. This is uh, uh, Dr. Chaitanya from Guntu. Uh, uh, Dr. Chaitanya, are you ready for your talk? And his talk is going to be on root tear, which is a more hot topic uh, in the last uh, eight to ten years now. I, I would say. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Subramanian sir for giving me this opportunity. 
uh, I'm talking on the clinical, clinical evidence of the root tear management. Uh, what is the right way to do? Uh, uh, the root tears are nothing but the radial tears located within centimeter from the meniscal attachment or it might be a bony abrasion. Uh, most of the times root tears are missed during the diagnostic arthroscopy or while doing an ACL reconstruction or anything. So your diagnostic arthroscopy or your any arthroscopy is not going to complete without examination of the root. So it's called as a, most often it is called as a silent epidemic. Coming to the anatomy, as uh, already Girish has, uh, Dr. Girish has covered, uh, middle meniscus and lateral meniscus, it has anterior horn and posterior horn. Middle meniscus posterior horn is nearly 0.7 mm lateral and posterior and it is adjacent to the PCL. One should be careful while doing the PCL reconstruction and most of the times, Medial meniscus posterior root is injured while doing a PCL reconstruction uh, if the tunnel is not correctly placed. So one should be careful while doing the tibial tunnel placement in the PCL reconstruction and coming to the lateral meniscus. Lateral meniscus posterior horn is just adjacent to the ACL uh, and uh, lateral meniscus posterior horn is 4.2 mm medial and 1.5 mm just posterior to the lateral tibial eminence. Uh, nowadays, uh, the meniscal root tears have gained more popularity. Um, what happens if uh, the meniscal root is not repaired? Uh, the joint kinematics has been completely deranged if it is not repaired and early development of osteoarthritis and which causes more morbidity. Most, uh, uh, most of the times, uh, meniscal root tears are degenerative tears uh, and compared to the traumatic, which are seen in the middle-aged women. And uh, they represent up to 30% of the reported posterior horn of the medial meniscus tears. Um, as me, uh, all of us know, medial meniscus is less mobile compared to the lateral meniscus. So most of the times, medial meniscus posterior horn root tears are commonly seen in compared to the lateral meniscus. It has the highest incidence. Uh, as already said, uh, root tears are the silent epidemic. Most of the most commonly, they are missed in MRI and also in arthroscopy. So one should. Uh, one should not miss the meniscal root tears while doing the diagnostic arthroscopy or ACL. Now, uh, as uh, already Girish said, uh, rapid osteoarthritis and inability to resist the hoop stress. And if you if you are on the meniscal root repair, uh, it leads to the articular cartilages very early, and uh, it leads to insufficient of fractures and the contact pressure is increased in the compartment and uh, because of the decreased contact area of the meniscus, the pressure is increased in the compartment. Why you need to fix the meniscus uh, root? Why you need to fix them? Posterior horn root tears are almost equivalent to the medial meniscectomy, uh, which uh, um, instead of uh, doing a meniscectomy, um, root meniscectomy, better to leave. Uh, the results are going to be disastrous if you do a meniscectomy in the root, root tears. Uh, the pressures in the contact area in the lateral compartment are also increased. And then even if there is a middle meniscus root tear, the pressures in the uh, lateral meniscus uh, compartment are also increased. Posterior horn middle meniscus restores the contact pressures to the normal. So must and should, you need to repair the middle meniscus root whenever you observe there is a root tear. Radial tears, which are very near to the root, are almost equivalent to the root tears. Radial tears are most, most commonly seen in the lateral meniscus posterior hand when compared to the medial meniscus. Uh, most of the time they are with the ACL tears. So must and should, you know, you need to repair the lateral meniscus uh, posterior hand radial tear along with the ACL. Otherwise, the chance of even uh, load on the ACL graft is also more. Chance of ACL failure is also high. Uh, this is the biomechanical study which, is, uh, which has been done by the Rob Laprad. Uh, in this um, what are the biomechanical consequences of the complete uh, radial tear, medial meniscus radial tear near the posterior root attachment? Uh, in this, the dark line indicates the normal meniscal root. It has the highest contact area. When there is the contact, when the contact area is more, the uh, load on the joint is very less. And the remaining, the one with the stars are the root tears, which are 3 mm, 6 mm, and 9 mm. And the one beside the stars are the repaired one. If you you can easy you can identify in the chart the one with the stars are having the low contact area. When there is a low contact area, the stress on the joint is very high. Uh, as already discussed, hydrogenic uh, meniscus posterior root tears have been reported when uh, when you are placed when you are doing the 
PCL reconstruction, uh, that uh, PCL reconstruction T-well tunnel, which is a non-anatomic. 80% of the patients uh, with the spontaneous osteonecrosis are typically which are involved in the medial condyle, uh, also associated uh, root tears. Most of the root tears, uh, you, uh, you can find the medial spontaneous osteonecrosis of the re in the medial femoral condyle. Coming to the classification, Robert Laprade has been classified the meniscal tears into five types. The one is the one first type one is the partial root tear. Type two is the complete radial root tear. And in the type two, it has been divided again into type A, uh, 2A, 2B, and 2C, which is 3mm, 6mm, and 9mm, 9mm from the root. And type three is the bucket handle with complete root tear. And type four is the oblique one into the root attachment. And type five is the avulsion fracture, which is very, very rarely seen. And coming to the clinical examination, uh, like in the normal meniscus, one may not appreciate the McMurray's and medial joint plane tenderness very commonly in the root taste. Uh, most of the times, uh, you will able to feel the posterior and deep posterior knee pain in the maximum flexion in the spreading position. In the valgus uh, uh, stress test, you may feel the extrusion of the meniscus, but not every time. It's uh, very difficult to feel the meniscus. Uh, may or may not be associated with the pivot shift test. If there is an associated ACL injury, you may be able to feel it. Uh, most of the times, uh, uh, the common symptoms like locking, catching and giving away sensation, which are common in our regular meniscal tears, you may not be able to feel in the meniscal root tears. So, one should be aware by the history itself, we should be able to find out. Uh, patient often complains, uh, often like you will give a history of the uh, we heard a popping sound when we get out, got up from the chair or when we, when we try to squat, we got a pop, uh, popping up sound. Then only you have to come, uh, at that time, you have to come to an idea whether it is a root tear. And then coming to the investigations, uh, MRI is the uh, most uh, reliable investigation. In the MRI, you will identify the ghost sign. Uh, what is the ghost sign? Uh, ghost sign is uh, in the sagittal view. In the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, you are not able to feel that uh, meniscus. Uh, we, we can also call it as a lack of meniscal sign. And in the coronal view, you will identify clearly, you will identify the meniscus extrusion in compared to the uh, other one. And uh, you can also feel the spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee. Uh, there is a hyper intensity in the medial femoral condyle. Uh, coming to the treatment, uh, this direction. Um, root test, uh, whether to operate or non-operate. The patient is not fit for surgery and very elderly. Uh, we have to opt for a non-operative treatment. And operative, uh, only two options, whether to do a meniscectomy or a root repair. Operative meniscectomy, uh, is uh, the symptom may relieve, but it's a very short span. Uh, within a short period, uh, there is a joint, uh, joint mechanics is completely deranged. And it leads to disastrous uh, results. Patient uh, chance of arthritis is uh, very high. And uh, suture uh, repair with the suture anchor. Uh, the repair with the suture anchor is uh, technically very demanding, and it is a cumbersome procedure. And uh, I don't have any experience with this uh, suture anchor repair. And the regular one, transtibial pullout repair. Whether is a single tunnel or two tunnel. The results are same for single tunnel or two. Uh, whether it is a single tunnel or two tunnel, it's uh, the results are pretty good. The results are same for both. And one should be uh, looking to the other uh, meniscal tears when doing the meniscal root repair, longitudinal tears or complex tears or radial tears or uh, flap tears. Most of the times it is seen uh, with the flap tears uh, because most of it they are the degenerative tears. So one may identify the flap tear while doing a um, root, uh, root repair. And you need a very good assistance while doing a meniscal uh, root repair. Your assistance is also should be your assistance should also be very good. Uh, he has to be in controlled valgus stress should be given uh, while doing the meniscal root repair. Otherwise, it is very difficult to go in, uh, go and repair into the posterior on posterior side. Uh, single tunnel two suture transtibial pullout technique is the gold standard technique uh, for the meniscal root repair. Here in this video, this is the type 2 uh, middle meniscus posterior horn root tear. This is the acute one. Uh, this is almost one month. Uh, here I am using the first pass mini to take the bite. We have to take at least two bites, two sutures. 
which are at least 5 mm distance apart you have to take as deep as possible otherwise if you take uh, the bite is not so deep uh, chance of cut through is very high at least and uh, one more thing uh, you should the distance from the tip of the root is at least 5 mm the first suture distance should be at least 5 mm from the tip of the root and the distance between the two sutures should be at least 5 mm if it is a chronic tear and the root is too far you have to release the capsule you have to release the capsule and uh, bring the root to the anatomic uh, placement and after and after passing the sutures you just uh, take a uh, scoop and decorticate decorticate the tibial ends and with the the one which i am using is the arthrix root repair jig you have to place the jig uh just posterior to the medial tibial uh, tibial medial tibial eminence uh, anatomically and uh, around uh, 70 to 75 degrees uh, i'll place the jig and <coughs> i'll place the jig and with the bead pin you made the tunnel the tunnel should come exactly at the anatomic placement uh, anatomic uh, placement under the root uh, non anatomic placement of uh, the tunnel the chance of failure is very high after the placement of the tunnel uh you take one more fiber wire but should be, it should be a different color otherwise the tangling of the sutures and confusion is very high. chance of confusion is there after uh, then with with the uh, the two sutures which have taken bites are retrieved through the tunnel which you have done the tunnel on or the anterior medial cortex of the tibia after after this uh, the anterior medial cortex of the tibia it is fixed with an endo button or else you can put a suture disc and once this is done it, uh, finally you have to check whether that it is properly seated or not uh uh or the anterior medial aspect of the tibia you have to fix the the sutures has to be fixed with the suture disc normally i fix in around uh, 20 degrees of flexion not to fix in complete reflection or not to fix in complete extension uh ideally you have to fix in uh, around 20 to 30 degrees of flexion Uh, this is the case of uh, uh, done root repair of around two year follow and this is the guy luckily came today he has uh, he is a farmer uh, three year follow up he is doing scratching sitting cross leg and everything instead of repeated warnings he is uh, doing and this is the clinical outcome study done by uh, robert uh, laprad he has done the level 3 cohort study in nearly 50 knees with the follow up of 2.5 years uh regarding uh, regardless of the age uh, the the satisfaction rate is very high and you have done the anatomical posterior uh, root repair uh coming to the rehab uh, strictly the patient has to be in non weight bearing for about 6 weeks and uh, after uh, patient should achieve 90 degrees of flexion by the end of 2 weeks and 120 degrees by the end of 4 weeks uh, weight bearing should be allowed only after 6 weeks that to with a brace on should warn the one should warn the patient to avoid deep leg uh, leg press and squats for uh, more than 90 degrees at least a period of 4 months and finally i conclude not to miss the root tears root tears are common one in 12 scopes uh, age is not a matter uh, not a matter and one more thing uh, you should uh, look into that before doing a root repair uh, must and should you need a standing knee x ray whether the joint space is there or not and there is any medial compartment oa there is a severe medial compartment oa and you have done a root repair and it's going to be a failure so definitely must and should you need a standing knee x ray and check out the medial whether medial compartment is uh, uh, completely worn out or it is normal and anatomic repair is uh, ideally how to be anatomic done do anatomic repair then only it will going to be successful and uh, follow proper rehab then only uh, root repair results will be very good thank you for listening thank you so it is a it is good talk is there any questions uh, anyone having any doubts any questions just i want to add up some point rather than uh, um if you have grade 1 2 oa then we think about doing repair those who are in 3 or 4 oa then uh, we do uh, deform decorrection surgery yes sir we will ask you to so that's thing uh, uh, everybody should be aware of it 
uh, we should not be embarking on route repair and that kind of scenario. Yes, sir. Or go for a deformity correction surgery than uh, doing a route error, route error test. Yes, sir. Initial day of practice, I did one case, sir. Uh, there is a deformity. But, uh, because uh, you see a lot of patients coming with degenerative type of root tear than traumatic root tear. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Two traumatic root tears uh, are actually less common than degenerative. Whatever I see in my practice, yes, you sir, know, yes, sir. 35, 40-year-old people coming with uh, root tears, not the youngsters. Yeah. Yes, sir. Any other opinions from anyone? Any other views? Any other uh, uh, questions to ask? If nothing else, I think we'll go for uh, uh, next talk. The next talk is going to be about uh, experience and expertise, which is going to be by Dr. Nilesh Kamath about his surgical techniques of meniscus repair. Uh, Dr. Nilesh, are you ready to share your screen? Yeah, I'm good to share my screen. Yeah, please, please go ahead. Uh, can you see the? Yeah, we can, can see. You see the presentation. Uh, All right. Yeah, we can see. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you, Doctor Subra, for the invitation. And uh, sorry, once again, I've just lost my screen again. Just give me a second. Yeah. In the meantime, uh, Dr. Zaitanya, there are some questions in the chat box. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can answer it uh, yeah. by that itself. Yeah. Uh, something happened, and I just uh, I can see the taskbar, but I can't see the uh, the presentation. You can see the screen as it. You can see. I saw your presentation came up. No, but then something happened. It just said updating Outlook and. Uh, I just disappeared. Oh. Yeah, it's not oh, okay. That's yeah, right. it's there now. Now you yeah. can see it, right? I, yeah, I can see it. Yeah. So, without further ado, uh, thank you, Dr. Subra, for this invitation and uh, for this knee preservation and meniscal preservation symposium. So, what I'm going to talk is strictly practical on basis of what we have been doing and uh, and how do we approach this entire concept of meniscal repair. I think this has been covered in the past, but why to understand the fact that you have circumferential fibers as the major bulk, which are tied by these radial knots. Now, there lies in the principle that how would you want to place your, your suture repair? That means what is the configuration of your stitch? So if I were to look at the easiest thing, I remember Andy Williams saying this, that it's like you have noodles lying all across. And if you're going to use chopsticks and you're going to go parallel to the direction of the noodles, you will hardly get any noodles. So that is equivalent to horizontal stitch. As opposed to that, if you get your chopsticks vertical, perpendicular to the position of the noodles, you will get maximum number of noodles. And I think this analogy has stayed with me ever since because it's mandatory for us to get as much tissue as possible. One of the things which was happening in discussion was which meniscal tears are chronic and which are the ones you would consider a repair. I think what is extremely important is to read the MRI to look at the quality of the meniscus. If the body of the meniscus is not showing myxoid degeneration, it's not showing a degenerative signal, go ahead and repair it. You can do augmentation techniques, but by and large, getting this concept right that gain in as much tissue as possible when you're doing a meniscal repair is extremely important. The other thing which is important is to use non-absorbable sutures. Now, when we were resident, so even start, earlier on when we started off with meniscal repairs, I remember we used to use PDS. And with that PDS, the problem used to be the knot was so prominent that patients used to come in later with a prominent knot. As opposed to that, with the ultra-high molecular poly polyethylene sutures, you don't have these issues because they have great knotting properties because they're braided. Doing a stacked repair is something I'll show in the video, and you can use enhancement techniques. So we have heard this, that which tear to repair. Of course, indications are extending because nowadays you do go ahead and repair a cleavage degenerated 
That's exactly the case that I did today morning. But from discussion perspective, a reducible, stable, early tear in a young active individual, and preferably if you're doing a concomitant ACL reconstruction, that's an ideal scenario. So if you're looking at this particular picture, this is a brilliant tear which you wouldn't go ahead and do a meniscectomy because that will land up with a practical subtotal meniscectomy. You can see practically the entire posterior bone on the body of the meniscus is translating into the joint and you can see it's in the red red zone. So how do you repair? That's what my talk is. So primarily it's either the outside in, the inside out and all inside repair that we are going to do. And it's very important to learn the outside in and the inside out because in India, cost factor plays an extremely important role and we can't rely on industry for, for every municipal repair because each anchor is quite expensive and adds on to the total cost of surgery. So for outside in technique, what do you need? You basically need two 18 gauge needles. All you need to do is you can utilize this technique for pretty much the anterior two thirds of the meniscus. All you need to do is pass in the meniscus, pass in the needles to the meniscus in a configuration that you would like. You can either use a nitinol loop or a chia passer. So through one of the needle, you'll pass in your suture. To the other needle, you'll pass either the chia passer or the nitinol loop. And you will retrieve that suture through that chia passer or the nitinol loop. And as you get the needles out, you have a loop around the meniscus. There are various ways to bell the cat. If you don't have a nitinol loop or if you don't have a chia passer, this is something which can be done. Preload to 18, 18 French gauge needles with which are one and a half inches in diameter in length. You're going to take a loop with a monofilament suture. In this case, a number one nylon. You're going to pierce through the meniscal tissue and you're creating a loop here. Then open up that loop, get in another needle, which can then pass through that loop. It may sound complicated, but as you keep doing it, you will realize that it's not too challenging. In these scenarios, classically getting a vertical suture might not be possible. So many times I would prefer doing an oblique suture and then pass across the second needle. And then you can pass the second suture through it. A small trick here is stop the irrigation because normally if there is an irrigation, the outflow of the irrigation does not allow passage of the suture that easily. And it becomes challenging and quite time consuming to pass the suture across. Once you have the suture across, then through your portal, you're going to retrieve the suture. And then as you bring it out, you have a configuration which is there to be, to be tied on the outside by doing a surgical dissection and you're going to tie it on the capsule. So without any additional inventory, you can very well go ahead and with a monofilament suture or for that matter, a, a ultra high molecular weight a polyethylene suture, you can do an outside and repair. What about the inside out technique? This is pretty much for the middle portion of the meniscus that you would, would do this. This is where you need to use these commercially available cannulas. Now these cannulas will come across in a direction perpendicular to the affected part of the meniscus. And then these preloaded needles with the polyethylene sutures are then passed across. And then as you, you can either use a single barrel or a double barrel cannula. And then as you pull it across, you again have a loop on the outside. Again, I'll be showing this in the surgical technique itself. When you're doing an inside out technique, I would strongly recommend reading either one of these articles, which is, which is something which talks about the safety incisions. Now you can't do a blind passage of the needles for two things. One, these needles are extremely sharp. Second, you want to prevent any inadvertent iatrogenic damage to the intra to the extra articular neurovascular structures. So you will use a bent spoon, which will allow scribing off of the needle as you pass it across. So which are the safety incisions which you will take? More important on the lateral side. So your landmarks are going to be the Gurdish tubercle and the fibular head and 
along the anterior aspect from the gorge tubercle that's where you're going to place your incision you're going to go through scup subcutaneous tissue and isolate the iliotibial band the iliotibial band is incised and then you will reach along the posterior lateral corner of the knee this is the area where you're going to place your needle and this is where uh, place your spoon and your needle is going to sky walk the only important structure on the medial side is the saphenous nerve i'll be candid enough accepting that i don't use a safety incision anymore on the medial side but when i have to tie the sutures i dissect it down to capsule so that i don't entrap the saphenous nerve because it can cause a painful neuroma and that can be quite disabling the incision is pretty much along where the posterior oblique ligament would stay you're going to go in through the sartorius fascia blunt dissection is carried out and posterior to superficial mcl along the adductor tubercle and the attachment of the semi membranosus that is where you're going to place your spoon which allows you to sky off the needle as what we were discussing earlier lastly coming into the all inside technique which is probably something which is rampantly gaining popularity because of its ease but the problem is the cost factor here you are going to use two preloaded anchors on a needle it could either be something like a, a all suture anchor or it could be a peak anchor these are not absorbable anchors you are going to come in across at a direction which is perpendicular deploy both the anchors and allow compression of that particular tear what is important to understand is when you are doing these repairs your direction needs to be perpendicular if you are not going to be perpendicular your tissue is going to sky off so for example in this particular case if you are going to repair a lateral meniscus your viewing is going to be through the to the medial portal and if you come from the uh, viewing from the lateral portal and if you come from the medial portal you see the trajectory is not good in a scenario like this you are going to swap your your viewing portal that means you are going to view from the anterior medial portal you are going to come across from the anterior lateral portal and then you can see your trajectory is directly perpendicular to your lateral meniscus and it allows a straight forward repair so if we see a a particular video where there is a classical bucket handle tear involving right from the root in the peripheral zone you can see the leash of blood vessels right up there some chondral changes post traumatic tear this is what you would want to repair after reducing the tear the first thing you would want to do is enhance healing so you're going to do techniques like rasping you can do microfractures if there is a concomitant acl you don't need to bother about any of this because the marrow vents are as it is open once you have done this the choice is dependent on the surgeon whether to go from anterior to the posterior aspect but after having a look and after rasping the meniscus now it's important that the rasping should not be done only across the tear it is the pericapillary plexus that means the capsular plexus so along the synovium you would want to ras so that it allows that ingrowth of blood vessels which come through the first stitch which will come through is going to be on the anterior aspect and this is only through the capsule once you have done this as we had described in the previous model you can take an oblique orientation and with the with the preloaded suture you can see through the needle we have got the stitch across then through the first needle from where the needle had come through you can pass in a chia passer you have a meniscal mendeset chia passer nitinol loop you have multiple options which are there and you are going to retrieve this through the chia passer and as you bring it back that's your first stitch which is there for the meniscus you can do as many passes as you like depending on your expertise your time and then you are going to get in multiple bites across you need not tie them you just need to reduce them then as you go posteriorly you can use the double barrel cannula it's not necessary that the inside out technique needs to be done on the superior surface you can very well do it on the inferior surface as well commercially available cannulas are present and as you pass these needles across you can see that this as we do it on the inferior side 
it stacks the meniscus that means it loads it back onto the plateau after you have done multiple passes of this then you come to the posterior motion aspect and you can use the all inside devices wherein you are going to pierce the tissue either in a curved fashion or a reverse curved fashion and place the bites at least at around 8 mm from each other and once you have these two bites across and you tighten the sutures you will realize that it sits back flat onto the tibial plateau again multiple passages are done this this is an old video so this is the the ultra fast fix we still use the ultra fast fix whenever possible because it's a little cheaper as compared to your fast fix 360 after your bites are done that's when you're going to pay attention to the outside of the knee and this is important that you take either multiple small stab incisions and you dissect out the tissue right till the capsule using small langen bags or cat's paw retractors the idea is to try to save the the saphenous nerve as much as possible so there are various surface landmarks which are available which tells you the rough orientation of the location of the saphenous nerve easier said than done but try to stay on the capsule and if you're going to stay on the capsule by and large you're going to prevent any kind of injury to the nerve after the repair is done this was an isolated bucket meniscus because the acl was intact so we enhance the technique by doing a prp some patients we also do a fibrin clot i think that was a technique when in pkc when we had uh, dr charlie brown showing that technique and that's something which we use in practice especially when we do an isolated meniscal repair and then after deflating the tunica you can just go in and then inject the prp at the site of the capsule and that allows for the enhancement of the healing in the post op rehab protocol it depends whether you're doing it concomitantly with an acl or without an acl if it's an isolated bucket meniscus or a meniscus repair you would probably keep the patient non weight bearing for 4 weeks followed by 2 weeks of partial weight bearing and then progress to full weight bearing likewise for 3 weeks you're going to restrict flexion up to 90 degrees and then gradually increase to gain full range of movement beyond 3 months with an acl reconstruction you can probably be a little more aggressive and then probably you can go ahead and make the patient full weight bearing over a period of 3 weeks or so thank you thank you Hello, so now could could you see that? I, yeah, yeah, no, you have to st uh, stop sharing your screen. Yeah, okay, fine. Yes, you could okay. see, you could hear, but there was no response. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Excellent, excellent demonstration of all the techniques. Nice. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Any questions from uh, anyone? Any the uh, anything in the chat box? So for whole meniscus repair, uh, PRP injection is needed. for a healing capacity so this is something when and we don't we don't do prp routinely this was one particular case where we had done it more than prp given a choice i would do a microfracture and i would do a fibrin clot fibrin clot is something that we we still do okay thank you i don't routinely do prp and all <laughs> that's it. because this is in acl reconstruction your bone marrow is already there um, absolutely acl reconstruction is no additional technique no yeah, additional technique yeah. right i i like your concept of uh, noodles <laughs> yeah because i think yeah. 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 that's something which really true. allows mm -hmm. to andy williams was so insistent on this is a meniscal workshop that we were taking and he said that if you want maximum tissue and that is where the concept of considering a meniscal repair if the tissue is good all the other criteria is if it's fulfilled but if the tissue is not good then then i think that's one thing one more thing probably in the same breath i would talk about is a compression stitch for for a cleavage tear and that's something which we have been doing very regularly 
that uh, earlier the thought process was when you are encountering a cleavage tear you could either tear, resect the superior leaf or the inferior leaf whichever is the thinner leaf or the unstable leaf but now for cleavage tears routinely what we do is especially towards the end of the cleavage to prevent for the progression of the tear we put in a compression stitch and that really works very well and patients also symptomatically are are quite okay great i just want to add some data about uh, number of meniscus surgeries which i read it from the literature is in us um, uh, over the last 10 years uh, annually they undertake about 300000 meniscus surgeries uh, in the past they used to do the same number of meniscectomy and uh, meniscus repair is around 32000 or something like that now it has become doubled up which is around 64000 now so meniscus repair in uh, incidence has become much higher now uh, but still a lot of meniscectomies are going on because we see that yeah. 300000 meniscectomy happens the meniscectomy rate has not uh, has not been different but the meniscus repair rate has become much higher now as far as the us data is showing now which is good that we are preserving meniscus <laughs> okay but i think in india one of the most important things is the cost factor and easier said than done because we are working in tertiary level hospitals where 70% of our patient volume might be insured 70 to 80% which is not true everywhere and then when you talk about a meniscal repair the cost of the surgery goes probably i uh, used to anchors more than yeah so everything logistic change completely so yeah. again i would encourage everyone to either get in the single barrel or the double barrel because doing an inside out technique or doing an outside in technique is something which really takes away the number of implants that you're putting inside the knee that's helpful great nilesh i think uh, it was a good talk and a uh, good contribution thank you very much for your support thank you so much next thank is uh, i'm going to uh, share uh, uh, professor reni vedang's uh, talk Uh, it is a, he has sent it through we transfer file uh, last night because of uh, due to a family commitment he could not come in so he has sent it through we transfer file so if that is okay i'll start sharing the screen or if we can do it are you able to see it yes sir yes yes sir good uh, okay so let's start with the friends that. it's a pleasure to join from uh, far away belgium okay. and uh, enjoy your company to discuss meniscal repair as i uh, will try to share my experience on the, the matter and uh, first and foremost the attitude we need to have if we are confronted with the diagnosis of an arthroscopic uh, finding of a meniscal lesion i think we systematically need to raise a question whether or not a repair is indicated or if we can do it let me uh, share with you just briefly one slide on the history of meniscal repair as we think of uh, Ian Smiley from England from Scotland who and this was 1946 so it's uh, a little bit away from our experience but i trained with this idea uh, and that was that if the meniscus was torn you had to take it out and you had to take it all out all out even if it cost you a second incision in uh, the medial back side of the knee joint to resect it to see a bone and even if you just thought it was torn you had to take it out this was the rule uh, i say 30 40 50 years ago and then uh, move on to biomechanics and here are some slides from andrew amis obviously you know that these uh, vertical longitudinal tears in fact if they are small enough <coughs> they're not really a reason for complaints of the patient of course they can get bigger but clinically they're not uh, 
so dramatic when they're small. And uh, the other issue is here is uh, a radial tear. And when you have a radial tear, of course, it can prolong or can move on to a parrot beak. It may move on in the lateral meniscus through the uh, hiatus, and then, then it's the end of the functional meniscus. And uh, which uh, lesions do we need to operate? Of course, there is a conservative treatment for small lesions when they are peripheral, because sometimes they really heal if you kind of wait long enough, like when they're involved with the medial collateral ligament, uh, elongation or tear. And obviously, uh, they preferably should be vertical, maybe a little bit oblique, but at least stable on palpation. And let me share with you some uh, slides from uh, our friend Steve Nornoski. When you uh, look at the basic okay. science okay. of meniscal healing, these are the fundamentals. It should be healthy meniscal tissue. It should have access to reparative cells. The patient should have access to access to bioactive factors, if at all possible, and obviously be in a favorable healing environment, and here we mean biological or biomechanical. And this is the ideal meniscal repair candidate. First and foremost, look at these two lines, and you must agree with this. It should be a stable knee joint or stabilized. It should have a good alignment, or you should combine alignment correction in young individuals, shall we say, below 40 years with peripheral longitudinal tears, a little bit bigger from 10 millimeters on, shall I say, with healthy meniscal tissue, and that may differ from the age. And of course, to have good results in the knee joint itself, you need to have minimal articular cartilage lesions, if at all possible. And they're successful. These repairs are successful. You kind of have uh, 80, 75, 80% of success. And who is then this uh, biologically challenged patient? The ones that we don't have really have a, a straightforward answer for in meniscal repair. Obviously, in the white on white zone, as you can imagine, we might have to add some biological factors. The one that is older than 40 years, with increased incidence of degeneration, you see that on the images, you would have a look at that. And quite a bit of these uh, individuals have this tissue degeneration already confronted. And then the chronic tears, and in fact, that goes together with what I just mentioned from uh, Stephen Orowski, chronic tears with uh, increased level of tissue damage. And then, uh, of course, these complex tears and these three uh, latter ones here are the same uh, meaning as the ones before. And these are the ones that you really cannot make an effective repair on because of this age, because of this tissue degeneration, and very often this already will be chronic. And you might increase your results. You might increase your results and discuss about this when you use vascular enhancement techniques. And Henning has described that with uh, blood, and a blood clot that he moved into the defect or into the uh, rupture of the meniscus create vascular excess channels and a synovial abrasion, which leads to, shall we say, uh, some arthrosis. And bioactive factors, fibrin clot, the ones that I just mentioned from Henning, PRPs, are they effective? There is no proof, but it goes along the line that the fibrin clot is really helping. And uh, possibly in the future, recombinant and then, uh, of course, uh, this is from uh, Dick Stedman, marrow stimulation techniques, hematrosis, as we know, obviously, that when you have an ACL tear, that you repair, that meniscal healing is much more effective, much more positive. Then we may discuss how far we should go 
when we look at these issues, the lesion type, we mentioned that already, the defect, site, or type, age of the patients, what about medials versus laterals, age of the lesion, chronic, not so chronic, how far can we go, the ligamentous status, uh, you know all of this, and uh, the information from imaging that before you start from the images, you can make already a diagnosis and prepare for your material that you're going to use in the surgery. And uh, obviously, and the film doesn't really show, oh yes it does, um, you have to make a decision when you're inside the knee joint, huh? then you see the lesion and then you know what to do or you know what to move on. So you have to make a decision And some wrapping techniques exist that has been described by Rose. Improve these healing in the white on white zone. And then the age is, uh, we mentioned that, above 40, below 40. At least the meniscal tissue should be healthy. Age should not be an absolute criterion. You may look at this on the MRI before you do the surgery. And obviously the older patient will have more, shall I say, complex degenerative tears uh, impeding on the results. The age of the lesion might be of interest. And I would say that according to my experience and in literature, the ideal interval is below 12 weeks. Very often when you're confronted with an ACL tear, you wait until the knee goes normal again, so to speak. And um, for the meniscus, you can wait 12 weeks. The uh, medials, also the laterals, they heal like spontaneously. And in quite a number of cases, is below three months is a bit less. Uh, but this is important as a stable knee joint when you don't have to really uh, repairing the ligament and especially the ACL, you can uh, be very careful and uh, rely upon physiological healing in the meniscal tears. Obviously, when they are vertical and peripheral, even more. About the ligamentous status, we know that um, you have to repair the ACL when you repair the meniscus. Both of them act together to reinstate normal function of the knee joint. But when it's a, a small tear, less than 10 millimeters, is usually can be neglected. Of course, you can suture these with one point or two points of suture, and that will help. Uh, but there is no literature to be found that suggests this is a requirement. And then let's uh, discuss a little bit on... Uh, two special indications. And the one that I want to discuss with you is the horizontal cleavage in young athletes, which comes forward when they are 30, 25, 30, 35. And this is what you see. It's been described by Beta in 1993 in Switzerland. And uh, usually at that time, people went on to total meniscectomy, which as you can understand in these young athletes, really detrimental for the function of the knee joint and their athletic activities. So when you try to repair that arthroscopically, this is not an easy task because like in osteosynthesis, you better be vertical on the rupture or on the fracture. And uh, when you do that arthroscopically, it's not really easy. Most of the time you're oblique. And if you're oblique, you're not very covering or stabilizing this tear. Therefore, Philippe Bofis, you know, from uh, Paris, from Versailles, 
he uh, suggested that we should do uh, a vertical repair by an open posterior open knee joint and here you see the tear and then when you put some vertical sutures it's really very 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 stable and it's not really a handicap to rehabilitation and at least you save uh, this uh, meniscus from further degeneration and rupture and uh, an open meniscal repair really really is very stable and helps toward the new integrity of the knee joint you see it uh, as it is after surgery and it's very easy to approach this in the posterior medial corner of the knee joint and of course we discussed or mentioned radial tears and these radial tears when they go through the meniscal wall and very often they start on the inside and then move on move on move on and in sportsmen this can be uh, really dramatic and therefore it is indicated to use this uh, what we could call a hashtag suture of these radial tears and the most often they will heal here maybe a little bit less here but at least you can make the circumferential forces stable again in these individuals and then I uh, would say we have really to push the indications in children and when you consider uh, the children a normal a normal child in when he's young and these are slides from uh, myself from Luxembourg um, quite a bit of them have this pivot shift in a normal knee joint when they're really very young so you might be mistaken uh, when you're confronted with hematosis in these children, like, shall I say, one third only is a meniscal tear. You know the difficulty it is when you are confronted with this hematosis. One third of these patients are patellar dislocations and uh, young uh, surgeons who do not have this experience miss that and move on to an otroscopy, which of course is not really required. Obviously, a number of them with hematosis have a uh, ligamentous tear of the ACL. And uh, the clinical diagnosis uh, is, um, like you see here, the, there is an extension deficit because very often it's together with locking and uh, according to this investigation, to uh, most than 90% of the cases. Is. But um, Bonnard, in Chotel, they did uh, a number of years ago an investigation in children, prospective in 60 lesion and retrospective in 52. And what struck the eye was in children, that time from accident to surgery was kind of enormous, shall I say, like one year from zero to 63 months. But 11 months was the mean, which is almost a year that these kids run around with a torn meniscus and uh, this is quite different from uh, the situation in adults as you know from your experience and of course when the delayed diagnosis goes together with delayed treatment and uh, in this investigation prospective and retrospective this was one year from accident to surgery uh, and that was in Europe and of course, if we look at the epidemiology, most of these cases were vertical, only very few because these menisci are young, but uh, half of them were in an unstable knee joint and 55 in a stable knee joint. The ones I just mentioned, that may be a tricky situation. The treatment was no treatment in 20% of the 15% of the cases dramatic removal in almost 40 percent and uh, repair was uh, initiated in like half of the patients and of these resected menisci 64 were flap tears 64 were flap tears but eight which is 13 percent were bucket handle tears that were resected in these very young individuals then again, we really need to push the indication there.
And of the 50% uh, of repaired menisci, that was done by classical sutures. Some of them it helped uh, by immobilization and uh, almost half by... So, ladies and gentlemen, I come to my end and um, we go through these 10 commandments that uh, the Société Française d'Arthroscopie and also ESCA has promoted. Of course, you need the preoperative MR. Uh, was it only for your technicity to be uh, ready for no surprises? Go try to repair with an all inside technique. If you can, inside out is good also, of course, but all inside is for the back of the knee joint. And uh, do not hesitate to debride the lesion essentially when you're confronted with chronic tears. And uh, go for a good and stable fixation. And uh, in the stable knee, the peripheral lesion should be repaired. We know that otherwise, this is not really a success. And the horizontal cleavage tears, we mentioned that in athletes, we should push repair. And in the ACL deficient knee, the medial meniscus should be repaired and maybe the laterals because these lesions are small, they can be left alone. And you have, of course, to combine the ACL reconstruction with meniscal repair. That's number eight. And then in children, as I try to clarify to you, the indications should be pushed. And the 10th commandment, obviously, is save the meniscus. It was a pleasure to share my experience on meniscal repair. And the meniscus himself is most grateful for your kind attention. So thank you very much for sharing these moments with you. Good uh, afternoon, my friends. It's a uh, I think, uh, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. yes, we can. I think he comprehensively told a lot of things. <laughs> and uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor Eni Vedang for his uh, uh, fantastic comprehension of uh, whole aspects of meniscus right from the past to current situation. Uh, thank you very much for that. Obviously, you will definitely listen to this lecture uh, uh, sometime later on YouTube or in Ortho TV. So, let him listen to our thanks also. Thank you. I just want to see, are there any uh, add, uh, points to be added or anyone having any discussion questions? Uh, please feel free to ask. Some points to add up is... Uh, Especially about children, anyone around the age of less than 15 or 16, whatever possible, try to repair it because they will definitely heal. Very good chance of healing it. Let me see the chat box. Is there anything in the chat box? Sir, uh, <coughs> I have not seen any questions as of now, sir. Okay, if that is the case, I think uh, uh, it's time to conclude the session. Okay, sir. So, I would like to thank uh, all the participants, uh, all the faculty members, uh, and uh, uh, especially Professor Reni Vedong for his contribution of a uh, uh, nice uh, talk on meniscus. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank Ortho TV team for telecasting our program and uh, thank you, Sanforma Group. Uh, with this, we come to the conclusion of the meeting. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.